everybody. Good morning, everybody, or good day, wherever you are. My name is Philip Kelly. I'm the Interim Dean of the Faculty of Environmental and Urban Change here at York University and the uh, former director of the, in, of the York Centre for Asian Research. And it's a great pleasure to welcome you to a joint event today between uh, EUC, uh, the faculty, and YCAR Centre for Asian Research. I'm going to start with York's land acknowledgement as we are present in the room with uh, our guest speaker, Saina, um, here on the York campus. Um, but obviously it's an invitation to reflect on um, indigenous land, wherever you may be. We recognize that many indigenous nations have longstanding relationships with the territories upon which York University campuses are located that precede the establishment of York University. York acknowledges its presence on the traditional territory of many indigenous nations. The area known as Takaronto has been caretaken by the Anishinaabek Nation, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, the Huron and the Huron Wendat. It is now home to many First Nation, Inuit, and Metis communities. We acknowledge the current treaty holders, the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. This territory is subject of the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, an agreement to peaceably share and care for the Great Lakes region. So it's a great pleasure on behalf of both YCAR and EUC to welcome P. Sainath um, to speak about his recent book, The Last Heroes, Foot Soldiers of Indian Freedom. And to introduce um, Sainath more fully, I'm going to hand over to my colleague, uh, Professor Ranu Basu. Ranu. Thank you, Philip. Um, good morning, everyone. My name is Ranu Basu. I'm a professor of the Global Geography Coordinator in the Faculty of uh, Urban, um, Environmental and Urban Change. Um, given the difficult and tense times we are in, the horrendous war in Gaza, the precarity of workers' condition in our own city, the rampant inequality in living conditions, we need stories of hope and political will. It is in this broader context and spirit of the talk, we hope that efforts will be made to attain a fair collective bargaining agreement with our colleagues on the picket line. QP3903. I'm humbled and honored to introduce Palagumi Saina as our esteemed visiting scholar at the Faculty of Environmental and Urban Change. Saina, I'm sorry that we are experiencing a strike at this time of your visit, but we hope there will be an opportunity for you to visit us again. A Maxi Say Prize winner, P. Saina, is an Indian journalist and a professor of journalism who focuses on inequality and poverty. The Nobel laureate Professor Amaratha Sen has called him one of the world's great experts on famine and hunger. In September 2021, he was given the Fukuoka Grand Prize, one of Japan's top international awards. Sainak was the Macro Professor of Writing at Princeton University in fall 12, 2012, and has been conferred doctorates by the University of Alberta at Edmonton and the St. Francis Xavier's University, Nova Scotia, in Canada. In India, he has taught journalism for 36 years. In 2014, Sainak launched the People's Archives of Rural India, PARI, a multimedia digital platform creating a unique database on rural life in India. This project has inspired a similar initiative here in Ontario called the People's Archive of Rural Ontario, based at the University of Guelph. Sainath's book, Everybody Loves a Good Drought on Rural Poverty, was declared a Penguin Classic in 2013. Yesterday, at the EUC YCAR Climate Seminar Series, Sainath presented some of his fascinating work in his lecture entitled, Telling the Stories of Climate, Farm Distress, Inequality, and Justice. He spoke about the context of climate change and its impacts on those most vulnerable. His more recent book, The Last Heroes, Foot Soldiers of Indian Freedom, which he will present to us today, um, is published in seven languages, tells the stories about anti-colonial freedom struggle of ordinary men <laughs> and women of India. This book, which has already received acclaim from large number of scholars, deploys ethnographic method to excavate a historical subject. It is an exemplar of anthropological history. His work over decades has brought difficult questions to the forefront of a nation struggling with internal strife, the historical continuation of class, caste, and gender divides, 
and the legacies of the post-colonial condition. These structural conditions specific to the region are most relevant to the challenges we face globally, whether it is the geopolitics of the migrant crisis, land grabbing and challenges of a capitalist, settler colonial society, racial capitalism and alienation, or the invisibility of gendered labor, a reminder on Women's Day today. Further, Sinat's decades of work and reflexive scholarship over time provide for us a forum for discussion and action. His multimedia digital platform of Harry, which includes videos and graphics and storytelling, is dedicated to the nearly 900 million people who live in the Indian countryside. These include the indigenous communities, laborers, farmers, fisher folks, herder, herders, pastoral nomads, among others. What is particularly novel about the current model and framework is that knowledge that is produced and recognized originates within the community itself, a decolonial methodology carefully crafted and shared for a wider public to seriously contemplate and address directly. I could go on and on, but I will stop here. And um, again, once again, welcome. Thank Thanks very much, uh, Ranu and Philip. I again like to begin by expressing my solidarity with the workers of uh, QP3903. And I do hope that there will be a swift and just settlement of their demands. About who India's freedom fighters were, let me begin by sharing the experience of visiting somewhere around 4225 universities and colleges since the book came out with this subject. Because remember, it comes out, the book came out in the 75th year, at the end of the 75th year of Indian independence. And the experience has been both exhilarating and sobering. So I'm facing these huge audiences of young people. And I asked them, yeah, so what is it we're celebrating? So in India got independence in 1947, August 15th. Yeah. So from whom? From the British Empire. Yeah. And uh, so what are we celebrating? I mean, what, you know, uh, what, what did you, uh, why, why did you have to throw the British out? I mean, what have you got against the Brits apart from the, the fact that they're a repulsive bunch of expletives deleted? But why did you need to throw them out? Then silence. One hand goes up. So they imposed unfair, very unfair terms of trade on India. Okay, not bad. What else? Uh, they imposed all kinds of duties and tariffs on Indian goods and, okay. Then one of them says, you know, uh, yeah, so they, they, they did not allow the Indian economy to, you know, function. All these arguments are also true of today. I mean, across the world for a hundred countries. So why did you have to throw the guys out? Then once, and why did you take so long about it anyway? So one, one hand goes up and says, sir, you know, as I understand, the British also did some good. They gave us railways. This is a fantastic argument I've heard in 20 universities and colleges, which is essentially saying that to get a good bunch of railways, you have to be colonized and enslaved and which is proven wrong by the fact that there are over a hundred countries that are not colonized, they're never colonized, which have very good railway systems. But all this is the outcome of the erasure of our histories, the erasure of uh, what actually happened under colonialism. Then one or two hands of the less confident type the more confident ones who say terms of trade, etc., are all the 
those in the thrall of the new economics, uh, kind of more hesitant and goes up and says, Sir, my grandfather and grandmother told me that the British made slaves of us, destroyed every aspect of Indian economy, society, culture, had a terrifying impact on what happened from which we have not yet fully recovered. Now, the most interesting thing about this answer is that the child got it from his grandparents and not from a textbook or a teacher. That, that I think, is the most fascinating part of it. Many of those who speak in this vein cite their grad, great uncle. Now, why the hell are they getting it only from their grandparents and not from their classroom? Why are they not getting it from the textbooks? And then when I say again and again, I ask, what, what did British colonialism do? So let's begin with what I tell them about what British colonialism did. There's a fair amount of scholarship that's thriving on what happened in the period from 1870s, from when you have a census and when you have some data and when you also when you have a lot more sources being tapped than were earlier. The latest and I think the astonishing work, unfortunately, none of this is coming out of India because of that measured erasure of the Indian freedom struggle, saying that it actually began 800 years ago with allowed, I mean, with the Sultanate of Delhi and the Muslim conquest and all that kind of crap. The, to all academics and students, I would strongly recommend the paper by Jason Hickel and Dylan Sullivan. Capitalism and Extreme Poverty and versions of this paper, the first appeared in World Development, peer-reviewed journal, World Development, November 2022. Unfortunately, too late for me to take cognizance of it in my book. Second, it's also been published. The Jason Hickel and uh, Dylan Sullivan paper has also been published in monthly review. It's been published in a number of places. And of the media outlets, I don't think a single major Western media outlet took note of it. Al Jazeera reported stories on it, which are quite decent, but no one else. Indian papers haven't said a word about this because they haven't read it. I think Frontline or Hindu may have had a few paragraphs somewhere. What do uh, Hickel and Sullivan show you? These are economic demographics. They've taken a period between 1880 and 1920. Why that period? One, it's the height of British imperialism. Two, 1880 onwards, because you begin 1881, you have the second census period, even if the data is not full. First census is 1871. So you begin to have data, comparable data, and you begin to have serious data from other sources as well, but the census of data of four censuses till 1920 itself is very strong. Now, what do they find on what British colonialism did in the single sense of what it did to human beings? Not in terms of Solomon's gold mines in Africa or anything, but what did it do to human beings? You know, one thing all of us became familiar with during the COVID pandemic, we all got familiar with the concept, though many of us still don't understand it, though it's a fairly simple one, excess debts. What are excess debts? Every society has a normal average number of debts, right? So suppose a big society has 10 million debts annually. In a given year, it has 15 million then obviously 5 million are the excess debts. And then demographers, health experts, others tried to attribute 
it to the cause of closest, greatest proximity. In our case, the pandemic. So that's how excess deaths are looked at. Anyone has any idea willing to make the wildest guess you have on what were excess deaths in the 40 years between 1880 and 1920? They've given you three possible figures. One is the lowest, strictest, most conservative figure, ignoring a lot of other data. One is their own assessment, and one is the high-end assessment. How many millions of people do you think died in this period? And sixty-eight million. Please remember that India in this period included what is today Bangladesh, what is today Pakistan, what is today parts up, I mean, up to the borders of Afghanistan, uh, little parts of Burma, some areas in protruding into Nepal. All this was treated as India. Hmm. And even before this, the British, within three years of the Battle of Plassey, when they defeated Siraj ud Daula, by the time-honored British method of buying out the opposition's generals, uh, you know, with the Battle of Plassey, mm -hmm. within three years, they started their land reform. By the way, the Baijus teach, speaks of their, what they did as Baiju's educational system online, speaks of what the British did under Warren Hastings as land reforms. I always cite, you, you should see what Warren Hastings himself had to say about it. And this is 100 years before the period we are talking. It's 130 years, or 20 years before the period we're talking. The first, the British and the children are horrified to know it in the colleges and schools. In the British period, we had 34, 31 famines, of which 24 they classified as major or significant. Tens of millions of people died in these famines. And I'm not even talking about the period 1880 to 1820. That comes later. The first of the Great Famines was also called the Great Bengal Famine. 1769. 1769 to 1771. 10 million human beings were estimated to have died in the province of Bengal, which in those days included parts of Odisha and all of Bihar. 10 million human beings. What does Mr. Warren Hastings, you know, the cult hero of administrators, write to the British East India Company? In 1772, in his report to the Bo Court of Directors, Warren Hastings, and I'm largely quoting him verbatim, is actually boasting about the fact, notwithstanding, notwithstanding the fact that nearly a third of the population of the province was decimated by the great calamity, we still managed to raise rents and revenue. He's asking for a salary hike, okay? He says, it would, be, it would be natural to assume that so great a calamity would have kept a pace with a consequent decline in cultivation. 10 million human beings have died by his own assessment. It would, but, and yet, and though that happened, though that did occur, we were able to hold rents and revenues and in fact at a higher we were able to raise them to a higher level than that which prevailed in the last year before the famine 1768 so what he's saying cheerfully is guys 10 million of these guys died on us but we beat the holy crap out of the rest and raised rents and revenue that's what he's saying and he's very proud of it and he says, by the way, he says how it was done. He says, 
that the rents did not fall, that the rents and revenues did not fall below uh, was owing to their being, I quote, this is verbatim, was owing to their being upheld violently to their former standards. To their being held violently to their former standards. It means that the death of 10 million people moved him not a whit. They were there to plunder and loot, which is what the East India Company was about, which is what giant corporations are still about. So you have this wonderful letter from Warren Hastings. By the way, you can pull it off the net. A letter to the board of the direct court of directors, as it was called in the East India Company. Then comes the second famine, the Dojabara famine, the skull famine, 12 million, 1776. 12 million deaths and skulls all over the countryside. So then you have, it gets the name, the skull famine. And so on and so forth. And until, oh, the great, the greatest dinner party on earth was held by the British in the midst of the 1876 famine. We have still not come to 1880. In the 1876 famine, remember what was the great year of 1876? The Darbar, the great Darbar. Queen Victoria, in, in the after the takeover of the crown, found herself in possession of a very large piece of real estate, which today we call India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Nepal, all these places. And she decided that queen didn't quite cut it as a title. Now, the only person who can promote a queen is the queen. So she called herself <laughs> Queen of England, Empress of India. That's the title she gave herself. And they held the greatest dinner party, the greatest dinner party in history. I mean, Nero's looked like a small afternoon tea compared to what uh, they did. They spent the equivalent of today of millions of billions of rupees. And uh, that Darbar, it had, you know how many official guests it had? 68,000. And they assembled at different parts, etc. 68,000 guests, all of whom were mainly royalty or aristocrats. Okay. Now, I don't believe that 68,000 Indian royalty and aristocracy went to the Darbar with their eco backpack tourism outfits. They went there, each went there with his or her huge entourage the carriage, the soldiers, the security, the horses, the guy who cleaned the horses, the guy who cleaned the horses, ship. All of them were, we are looking at somewhere between a quarter to a half million human beings involved in this exercise at a time when famine was raging. This famine was called the Madras famine or the Madras Mysore famine. Six to eight million people deaths is the estimate of all these figures of deaths, by the way, are from British demographics, one of whom turned entirely hostile to the British Empire. I don't know whether it was Digby or Lily. These were the two great demographers of the period. One of them became a journalist and became very hostile to the empire. So you have you have this uh, uh you know, uh, oh, oh yes. And for financing the great Darbar, which Victoria, by the way, never attended, she wrote, wrote a letter of regret to her subjects that, you know, it might impair her delicate digestion to cross the seas. So she, uh, she took a pass on that one. But they held it in the greatest party on earth, as the greatest party ever seen in human recorded history. So uh, the 18th, from 1875, they are piling up, from 1876 early, they are piling up the resources for the party. All that gets diverted from famine relief funds, from various other funds, to fund the greatest dinner show on earth. Look, if you read, if you read the newspapers of the time, it's phenomenal, it's, though they reported generally better than us. But here was this 
split personality existence of the media. The newspapers actually reported the deaths and the pan. They reported, you will find reports of peasants being bludgeoned to death at the barricades of Mysore and Madras, desperately trying to enter the city and gain some access to food that they cultivated and grew. The food that they grew went to the towns, went to the cities. So you will you can get accounts of people being clubbed at the barricades by the police. You will get accounts of artisans coming and deliberately committing crimes in front of the police so that they would be arrested and jailed because the average convicted prisoner was eating a lot better than Indians during the British rule. And especially during famine and pandemic. Uh, even during the farmer's struggle, even during the farm suicides epidemic in the um, late 90s, I did that comparison between a farmer's, a widow, a woman farmer lost her husband to suicide. She was living 20 kilometers away from Mysore, from, the, from a central prison in Karnataka. And what did the diet of the convicted murderer in the prison was a lot better than her uh, daily food. Okay. So in the in the uh, Victoria Party, in the Victoria Party, you had a gigantic uh, uh, spending of money, and you had this famine going on. The newspapers <laughs> report the famine. I mean, they report the famine deaths and these dramatic scenes fairly well, better than we do today. And they also report the glory and the pomp of the Darbar, but they make no connection between the two. Incidentally, only one historian and one history book makes that connection, which is in fact where I'm drawing from on that particular party. And that book is Late Victorian Holocausts by Mike Davis. Davis shows you the connection between Victor, Victoria's Darbar and the famine. Had it not been for late Victorian Holocaust, Victoria's connection would, to the famine would be a secret of history. Call it Victoria's original secret. Okay. Uh, and you know if, when you when you I'm talking to the kids and they are increasingly frozen there are kids in the front rows a couple of girls tears are coming down their cheeks when they're hearing what happened to their own great 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 grandparents and ancestors and there is pin drop silence in a hall of 200, 300 youngsters, that's a lot. And for the first time, they're getting to know. And I always tell, you know, one of, by the way, one of the quotes that I get from there is what I had in my textbook in, in, in uh, primary school, or, you know, the sun never sets on the British Empire. Now, I come from a freedom struggle family. Many of my relatives spent years my granddad spent many years in British jails. He was, by the way, a very privileged person by Indian standards who went and studied in Ireland, got involved, became a Sinn Féin supporter and participated, plotted in the Easter uprising and was very lucky to escape a firing squad. He was deported because of various reasons we won't go into. So... Um, um, so various reasons that we won't go into but the Irish had a wonderful take on had a very different and a far more accurate take on the sun never sets on the British Empire and I share that with the kids the Irish revolutionary said the sun never sets on the British Empire because even God can't trust those bastards in the dark <laughs> yeah. and I think that fairly summed up the reality that our ancestors lived in, you know, our great-grandparents and others lived in. 
So you have, then you come to 1880. 1880 to 1920, they give you three estimates with approach, it's based on where you draw the baseline. See, when you take the period 18, 1880 to 1920, you're overlooking the fact that the British were already there for 130 years from 1757. So when you're taking the baseline age, uh, when, when you're taking the death rate, when you're taking the death rate of 1880 and seeing how bad it becomes in 1920, you're ignoring the fact that they already devastated the life expectancy and uh, death rate of Indians. So the death rate increased from 37.2 deaths in from, from per thousand in 1880s to 44.2 deaths per thousand in 1920s. Actually, the death rate in 1757, 1800s would have been even lower than 37.7. Likewise, with life expectancy. And I'll tell you how the British demographers speculated. What they found, what the big ladies, all of them found, was when the British arrived in India, that the average Indian life expectancy was slightly higher than that of Scotland, Wales, and Ireland. Mm -hmm. and similar to that of England. Now, if you take that baseline, that as a baseline, then you're going to get horrendous figures. So they do it by only those 40 years, baseline within that, only the census, no other data, and they give you three figures. At the bottom, whatever, whatever you do, whatever exclusions you make is 50 million deaths in 40 years. 168 million deaths is taking the broader assumption. And they say, whichever way you cut it, the number of excess deaths, we're not talking about number of deaths, we're talking about excess deaths, was in the vicinity of 100 million. This is Hikel and Solomon. And everything that I have read and learned tells me that this sounds totally authentic. Uh, by the way, when we say 50 million deaths or 100 million deaths, may I point out that if 1% of 1% of 100 million deaths had occurred in a European country, we'd be crying genocide. Yeah? I mean, remember uh, Bosnia and everything else. But 100 million deaths of very disposable brown people. What the shit does that matter? Yeah. And while all this discussion is going on and this information is coming out, India lowers its flag to mourn the death of Queen Elizabeth, the monarch, the symbol of British colonialism in India, who, by the way, was, may have been a very lovely old lady, but wasn't all that innocent. She celebrated her honeymoon in Kenya, in the tea drops, uh, uh, you know, resort, at a time when the British were busily engaged in massacring Kenyans in the Mau Mau rebellion. Yeah, so you can you can imagine how our living freedom fighters felt about lowering the flag for Queen Elizabeth. So who were these freedom fighters? So they begin to protest, and from the 17 late from the 1760s, the Adivasis, the indigenous people, as always, are the first to die for freedom, the last to gain gain from it. The Adivasis of Jungle Mahal, in now in Purulia, West Bengal, and extending into Bihar fought the British for 40 years in what was known derogatorily as the Chwar Rebellion. Bengali for Chor plus Niche, low and criminal element. 40 years they fought, they were, that was genocide, yes. They were white. Then 1780s and 90s, the huge rebellions in the South that actually brought the East India Company to the brink of fall collapse by the Maruda brothers and Veerapandya Kattabomma. 
in Tamil Nadu. 1790s, a gigantic threat to the empire ends with the killing of Tipu Sultan, the one and only Indian prince who died on the battlefield fighting the British. Everybody else was a collaborator. Right? No one else died on the battlefield fighting mm -hmm. the British personally, in the, directly the Indian prince. And he was the one who had never collaborated, never compromised with them, and is today demonized as a hate figure by in the fundamentals. Anyway, so then uh, people start fighting. You know that the Bengal uprisings began 90 years before the first shot was fired, fired in 1857, up north. So it also, the way we write our history, it was like independence was brought to us by a bunch of returning Oxbridge elites. It was not. Or by the nobleness of the British, they were, you know, good guys and sports, and they decided that Indians were mature enough and they withdrew voluntarily. They did not. They were kicked out of the country. And armed rebellions and revolutions had a lot to do with it. Uh, the other thing is that there was the great man theory, you know, uh, and it is a man theory. A handful of great people went to England, learned, read there, and learned about the ideas of freedom from reading Voltaire and Rousseau and whatever else and written. Because India, of course, never had any ideas of freedom. It's a completely racist reading of history. Completely racist, but embedded in the minds of many, many, many Indian middle classes. So that's another. Who were the people? I decided to look at the ordinary people and their role in history. Um, none of what was achieved in independence in 1947 could ever have happened had it not been for the masses rising against the British. And you will find, by the way, the great men themselves denounced the great men theory. Gandhi in 1914 and in 1931 says, in 1914, addressing a felicitation over his victory in South Africa, he tells the audience in London, your felicitations are to the wrong address. The victory was entirely that of the struggle of the indentured laborers. I was merely their vakil, a face to their agitation. In 1931, he writes a letter to Prema Bai Kanta, who is praising him for the great man bringing revolution. He says, great men appear to be the cause of revolutions. In truth, the people themselves are the cause. Bhagat Singh writes to Pandit Shiv Varma, what is the role of us revolutionaries in the edifice, in the building of freedom? He says in that great edifice, we revolutionaries are the gems that embellish the edifice. We did not build the foundation that came from the suffering of the masses. We did not make that. So all the great men themselves are disowning the great man theory. When I was growing up, my granddad would be visited by people who were obviously of a very different class, caste background, very different educational background. And they, after he, they left, he would tell me, it wasn't guys like me who brought you independence, it was those people. He had been a trade union leader and had led the 28 and 31 textile strike and railway strike. And he would, those were his old comrades. So I looked only at people who had not benefited from their sacrifices. And that's how the last heroes, foot soldiers, they are from, they were selected from many others, representative of the North, the East, South, West, and Northwest. A couple of people I was tracking in the Northeast died during the COVID period of old age. By the way, the youngest of those still alive is 98, is the infant, two of them. The oldest is a woman in West Bengal, Purulia, 105, Babani Mahatma. Alive, articulate as anything. True. Over 20 years of interviews and meeting and 
I kept putting it off thinking I need to do a better job. Then suddenly all of them start dying. So I did the thing with 15 people who were alive. I'm going to tell you two, three little stories of them. Hausa Bai Patil, whom the book begins with. Her story, one of, she's a farmer. She's 17 years old, 1943. And she has a three-year-old child already, whom I know personally, the child. I knew her very well personally. Uh, I met her a few times for the interviews. Her story begins in front of a police station in Sangli in 1943, where she is being brutally thrashed and abused by her husband, a few yards in front of the police station. Behind them is the railway station of Sangli in Bhavani. The police, of course, don't intervene. Man beating wife, this is India, national sport. You know, so why the hell should I intervene? The police didn't intervene. Her brother is standing nearby. She is appealing to her brother, take me home with you. This guy will kill me in a few days. And the brother, good Indian brother, says, no, you're his property. You have to go with him. Then the guy says, why wait a few days? I'll kill you now. And he picks up a rock and goes to smash her head. Then the police intervene. You know, man beating wife, okay. Yeah. Man killing someone in front of your police station. There's going to be a few uncomfortable questions from your superiors. So they go out, stop the fight, lecture the two, scold them, reconcile the couple and tell them, now please just get out of our police. Get out of there. And Hausa Bai, 17 year old, says, How will we go to our, get out of here? We can't afford train tickets. This idiot has drunk it all in alcohol, whatever money we had. So police get the tickets, put them on this train, and send them off, steaming away into the sunset. And the police return to the police station to find that in their absence, Hausa Bai's comrades in the underground revolutionary movement have looted the police station of all its weapons, its money, its arms and ammunition. And that wasn't her husband. It was a fellow comrade in the underground movement called the Tupan Sena, the whirlwind army. Yeah? And the brother was no brother. Hmm? Uh, he was also a comrade in the Tupan Sena, which was the armed wing of a spectacular movement called Prati Sarkar, provisional government. In 19, early 43, lot of British colonies declared independence because the Brits were with their backs to the wall in Europe, imminent Nazi invasion of the mainland. Troops were summoned back from Africa, from everywhere to come and defend that wretched island. And so many people took advantage of it and uprisings took place in Midnapur, the Chittagong Armory Raid, the Koraput Uprising, all over the world colonies started rising in 43. The, the Prati Sarkar seized 600 villages. Two of the characters, so three people from the Prati Sarkar are in the book. Hausa Bai being the most spectacular one. They seized 600 villages and ran them for three years and only dissolved their government when Gandhi appealed to all revolutionary groups to return to the mainstream since independence was announced for 47. Hausa Bai, now Hausa Bai goes on, she makes, she swims across the Mandovi River in darkness later that year to bring weapons from Portuguese held Goa, from Portuguese held Goa to, for the revolutionaries in Maharashtra to take on the British in armed struggle. How uh, her her teacher and comrade uh, Captain Ramchandra Shri Patilad, known as Captain Bao, like calling someone Captain Dada, Captain Elder Brother, pulled off the biggest train robbery in India's history on the Pune Miraj Train Express. When I ask Hausa by seventy four years later, sitting in her drawing room, I ask her, all all these fifteen sixteen people have some common things. 
they are all cantankerous old people who can't give up fighting. 80 years they fought, right? So anything you say that seems to challenge their what they sacrifice for, their attitude. And the second thing, they all have a sense of humor, which is, I suppose, the only way to have survived what they did. And I ask Hausa Bhai, Hausa Bhai, what is your enduring memory of that period, of that event at the police station? Oh, she says, that enduring memory is engraved all over my back. That scoundrel comrade, he hit me too hard. <laughs> then I said, did you tell him that you're hitting me too hard? She said, I was screaming at him, but he was whispering to me, Hausa Thai, it has to look authentic only, then the police will come out. And she was laughing as she said it, okay? And he was right, actually. It's only when he picked up the rock to kill her that the police actually came out of the station. So that's one character. The other phenomenal character, and I will show you a two-minute video of her, is oh, another unusual thing about the book. Please look for any freedom fighters books anywhere. There are lots of women freedom fighters who, in the way we define freedom fighters in our laws, were all marginalized and excluded. The laws we have on who is a freedom fighter excludes the roles of women. Malu Swarajya, the most well-off of these revolutionaries, but a renegade. She was born into the most feudal part of the country, Telangana. And the Telangana communist uprising in Telangana was beginning in 43. Yeah. And uh, she was 13 years old. Now, this woman whose father was an awful feudal landlord, middling, not giant, but middling, she learned as a landlord's daughter, learned horse riding, fighting. At age 11, she started attending. Marxist study classes by the underground communist party. At age 13, she was killing Razakars of the Nizam's militia, the Nizam of Hyderabad's militia. She killed several Razakars with a slingshot. Well, it's worth remembering that for 40, 50 years, that has been the weapon of choice or necessity of young children in the West Bank and Gaza. But I had to ask her, I interviewed her in front of 1,500 techies. And this is the problem with interviewing these people. When they see you asking questions to which you already know the answer, they get suspicious. They get irritated. You know, I'm asking her things which she knows I know the answer. I'm asking her the quest dumb question because there's a dumb audience out there, okay? And you have to ask that 1,500 techies in Hyderabad. And I ask her, how I? Yeah, yeah, all this um, uh, slingshot stuff is good. And you went on to use a rifle at 16. Can you imagine what a special person this woman was that the entire uprising hmm, at age 16 appointed this young girl as the head of all the armed squads of Warangal, Telangana, the epicenter of the uprising. Not female squads, male and female armed squads. She was the big boss. How it also speaks well of those old men of that time that they could see the, you know, caliber and character. Of, and she remains a warrior to the end, including where she's ticking me off on stage. And I ask her, yeah, this is fine. I have seen Irulas and uh, Bora Bondas kill a wild boar with a slingshot. I've seen uh, them bring down birds with it. But is it really a useful weapon in close-up human combat? She gets mad. She stands up. She's 84. Last interview is when she's 92. She stands up, plucks out a slingshot, and starts swinging it around with a cricket ball. She looks at all the terrified young audience in front of her and says, Telugu, Telugu, Odule. Then he writes, he says, no, okay, I'll take out the stone so that you don't get hit. I don't want any. One of our comrades there is trying to help her. And she says, stay away, you'll get hurt. He's about 35, 40, he's about 40, she's 84. Mm -hmm. And I mean, that is Malu Swaraj. And the beautiful thing 
that the people who, the, the young techies gave her, the young techies gave her four standing ovations. Yeah. She didn't speak a word of English. So I was asking questions in English. Someone else was translating her Telugu into English. Yeah. And uh, the techies asked her, it's all very well for you, Malugaru. You, you used slingshots and um, uh, rifles and all that. We are only techies. What can we do? Without batting an eyelid, she tells them. Did you ever hear of Occupy Wall Street? It was full of techies like you. Didn't they go out there and struggle? Then the second question comes from there. They, they say, it was all very, very well for you. You could go around killing people with slingshots and rifles. We can't do that. What should we do? She said, yes, the slingshot was my weapon. The laptop and the mobile phone are yours. Use those to fight for justice. There was about two minutes of standing ovation for that. <laughs> you know, the lap slingshot was my weapon. The laptop and mobile are yours. Anyway, let me just give you a glimpse of Malu Swarajan. And I won't even play the whole thing. Oh, sorry. I'm, I'm sorry. It did start at the right place. I'm... I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm Anadu <laughs> That was her at eighty four. The Nizam's wazir placed a bounty of 10,000 rupees with which you could buy 83,000 kilos of rice in that village on her head. This is her at 92. <laughs> By the way, that is Malu Swarajim at 16. Her, her living comrades in the Communist Party who gave me the photos from the archive, they say they believe this photo was taken by the police, not by the, yeah, by the Nizam secret police. Doesn't she look good? So smart and, yeah. So that is Malu Swarajam. That's her on the extreme left. Well, I'll end Malu's there. The next guy, 
Now, this is another spectacular character. He is a, he's alive. He walks faster than I do, and I walk fast. And he is 98. His name is Shobaram Gherwar, and he's the only living Dalit freedom fighter. Because mostly Dalits died, their life expectancy is much less than the rest of us. But he's alive, he's in great shape. And he's a curious character who tells you how complex the different streams of the... Nobody was in airtight compartments. Only one political force, as he tells you, did not participate. The RSS never participated in the freedom struggle. Now this guy calls himself a, I will put it on, he calls himself a Gandhian, sworn self-declared Gandhian, who also is an, whose hero is a maker, and who participated and made bombs in the revolutionary underground. So when I ask him how he reconciles all this, he says, Maine dono nadiyan mein gaya. Gandhivad or Krantivad. <laughs> I went down both streams, the Gandhian stream and the revolutionary stream. Then I asked him, how do you choose between Gandhi and Ambedkar? He got very angry. He really blasted me. He said, why should I choose? You choose. Who are you to tell me to choose between them? He said, those principles of the Mahatma that I admire, I follow those. Those principles of Baba Sahib that I revere, I follow those. Why should you tell me that I have to choose one or the other? Hmm? And this man stays alive to defend the freedom fighters' bhavan, the one office, a, a monument from the real estate mafia of this town, Ajmer. And he tells and he tells me, and every day he walks to that office, at, at least three times a week. It's a huge distance away. When I was there, I had a vehicle and I took him. This is Shobaram Gherbar, and he will tell you what, when I, I ask him specifically about the role of different people in the freedom struggle, it's about two and a half minutes. you think they should go into screen room? Sorry, I'm sorry. That's the freedom fighters <laughs> gathering place. Yes, there you are. So that is Shobaram Gherbat. There are other times, oh, by the way, the, one unique feature, which I'm very proud to say I created for the book, at the end of every chapter, there is a QR code. It's written for a new gen. And if you scan the QR code, you can gain access to these videos directly over there. Hmm? And in some cases where we have no videos, photographs of the families of the freedom fighters. So 
in some, what did I learn from these people? Captain Bao is the guy who, if you see the book starts with a page with a single line, just one line. When I was gushing about him and how lucky I was to find him as a pioneer of freedom and he stopped me and he said, we fought for two things. We fought for freedom and independence. We attained independence. And I think that said more than a volume of in another historian could write. We fought for freedom and independence. We achieved independence. And later on, he says, freedom is still the monopoly of the king. Every one of the characters in this book, in different language, many of them are illiterate. Salihan never saw the inside, outside of the school. They never had schooling. But every one of them, in some way or the other, tells you the difference between independence and freedom, which is why these guys are active at their 90s and their hundreds. They remain active. And Sankaraya was giving lectures on time at 102. Yeah. So the difference between independence and freedom and these, who were they? They were farmers, laborers, cooks, couriers, homemakers. That's who they were. They were Hindus, Muslims, Dalits, Adivasis, atheists, Buddhists, you name. These were the people who brought India independence. Thank you. I think you have to press escape on your program. A stop share. So thank you so much, Sai. That was a sort of brilliant historical sort of neurological study of, of um, India's freedom movement and the power of mass organizations in resisting um, and anti-colonial movements and, and, and anti-imperialist movement and so many lessons to the present. So thank you. I mean, look forward to reading the book and learning much more. I'm going to take uh, questions now from um, anybody who's here or in the audience. Um, thank you. Do we have questions? Um, Or anybody yeah, from here? Yeah, we have. Oh, you've got the questions. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, uh, thank you so much for sharing all that you did, both in the form of text as well as space. Um, I'm curious about how did you get started? Like, what was the first thread that you chose to draw out and pull on? Well, the first thing is that I was trained as a historian and not as a journalist. I teach journalism, but I studied history. And I studied history amongst, yeah, from what I believe was the greatest faculty ever of Indian history. It included Romila Taffer, S. Gopal, S. Bhattacharya, Bipin Chandra, K. N. Panikkar was my guide. So we learned a very different approach to history, the socio-economic history and not Raja Rani, King, Queen histories, but of people, of rebellions, of revolts. So that was one place where I was coming. Second, I was born in a freedom struggle family. And my engagement with the history of the freedom struggle begins at age three and a half, when a very elderly old Scotsman comes to see my grandfather. My granddad is trying to recognize who this old Scotsman is. He knows that he knows him. And the Scot is smiling at my granddad and saying, don't you recognize me? And my granddad says, I'm sure I know who you are. It's just that I think it was 30, 40 years ago that I knew you. And then, he, so he says, well, the, the Scotsman, elderly Scotsman tells my granddad, maybe this will jog your memory and gives him a small clock strip with some numbers on it. And granddad bursts out laughing because that was his prison convict number and that was his old jailer. 
Uh, that was so the you know, granddad asks him, asks the Scotsman, why on earth did you keep it? He says, I had my eye on about half a dozen of you who I thought would amount to something. So he kept those, he kept Nehru's, he kept my granddad, and he went around 40 years later giving it to them. So he would he would have been able himself. Uh, but and then when he was leaving the room, he tapped me on the chest and said, be good. I threw your granddad in prison. <laughs> and left me shocked that my granddad was a jailbird criminal prisoner. You know, that was quite, at three and a half, it was something to cope with. Right? So that day I started asking questions. How, why did you go to jail? It starts from there. The third is, I've been covering the Indian countryside as a rural reporter for 35 years or more full time. And even before that, wherever I went, for me, the freedom struggle is the greatest chapter in our history. Hmm. Wherever I go, I ask in the village, do you have any old freedom fighters left alive? Sometimes they'd say, Shahid Putra, hai. only the children of the martyrs are here, but no. And sometimes they'd say, yes. And I was, I found many, uh, but here's the tragedy. In five years time, not a single one will be left alive. And current and future generations of Indian kids will never get to see, listen to, touch, engage with, converse with a bona fide fighter for Indian. That's the tragedy. We have lots of questions. I have it. And just in relation, we have a couple of questions. And in relation to that, I was just wondering, you talked about your tours to different universities and speaking with the youth and you know, sharing these intergenerational stories that are, as you said right at the beginning, that could you know have a possibility of being erased. What was their response to and what was their sort of um the hope or the the response re learned from these? The lessons? response was fantastic mm -hmm. from beginning with. So they gave us the railways to wanting to just go out and erase every Englishman who's there. That I mean that that was the anger and this thing. And but I also learned something from it because the number of people who told me, sir, my grandmother told me how they destroyed the weavers of Bengal. <laughs> no, that that sort of I if after the first two times that this happened, everywhere else I tell the kids, when you go home today from this talk, I want you to talk to your grandparents. <clears throat> I want, if some of you are so young, 17, 18, you have great grandparents still alive. I want you to talk to them and you will find, I promise you, you will find Every family has a story of the freedom mm -hmm. That is what you were talking about. Yeah. So uh, I get I'm getting I get to this day, I'm getting emails. I spoke to my nanny, and she said about how her mother and father were in jail for so many months. Hmm? So it's yeah. it's there. How do you know, the, the thing really is about um, erasure of history and recovery and who writes the history. You know, the, as, as I said the other day, the, there's a lovely saying in Swahili, a lovely saying in Swahili. If lions were historians, the tales of the jungle would not favor the hunter. So, there you are. That's the yeah. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for signing up for this lecture. And I remember, you know, in 2013, when you uh, shared your thoughts on farmer suicide, you made a kind of distinction that BJP is nothing but Congress plus cow. I still remember that. Oh, that is Arun Shoghi. Yeah, but but I agreed with him. Yeah, yeah. agreed with it and just that it stick to my mind till today. Stuck to it in okay. my mind. So my question is somehow related with the idea of erasure of history that you are pointing out. 
And uh, this makes me to think that the kind of work which you have produced is again something unique. And I'll say unique because as a student who has thoroughly studied, you know, from class nursery to and masters, have not come across such a kind of account, at least till class 12, you know, in Indian history. So my question is, why do you think that the post-colonial state, and especially during Pandit Nehru, Pandit Nehru's time, consciously omitted such an account, important account of history making? And I have some quote for that. I was reading Deepesh Chakraborty the other day. He says, and he refers to one of the speech of which Nehru gave when protest was happening in Patna on the rise of bus fare. He says, in the name of politics, I do not see demonstration and hooliganism as the proper stuff of politics that student could take part in. Now, this is position of the other level. Now, that makes me again to think, as an activist, which you are, what ramification do you think that the post-colonial state yeah. has on the subject? I get the question, yeah. Oh, oh. See, first thing is, I, I just said, history is always written by the victors. Who were the victors? The great man theory worked out in practice politically. Yeah. Who were those? Uh, incidentally, by the way, the Congress then was a different political party from what it is now. It was a coalition which over decades goes into, spins off into other political forces. The Socialist League, the other, so the Lohiate Socialist League, JP and others League, Dareswami and the CSP in Karnataka lead, many of the communists lead in 1930s. Many of the other political parties came out of this very large coalition that Gandhi built. There were always those tensions within the Congress party. It was more an alliance and a coalition than a single political party. The triumphant trend in that party all of them are entirely, you can, you can see the class and caste and gender backgrounds of who are the victims. And it will reflect in their history. Second thing, the same people who were pretty radical and revolutionary as students in the British period are making that kind of statement because now it's their state. It's their state. And they can't accept fighting the British is okay. Why are we fighting us? We are our, we are one people. I think this has happened pretty much in almost every form of life. The one the one that I'm very familiar with outside of India is South Africa. Look at the AMC. Who can deny the greatness of a Mandela? No one can. Yeah. Who, by the way? always swore for 30 years that Gandhi was his inspiration. When, when South Africa became independent, he requested the government of India that the first ambassador or high commissioner should be a member of the Gandhi family. And my friend Gopal Gandhi went there as the high commissioner. Okay. But look at the ANC now. You see, uh, you can also look at it, I mean, even in the Palestinian movements and the PLO. That, that sort of regression does occur once you've got the main enemy who united everybody, when that person is out of the picture, the other trends and identities will come up, will claim their share, will claim their thing. I think the erasure has many, many, I think it has a class background, a political background, a caste background, a gender background. That's why I tried organizing on very different lines in the book. And I tried doing that in Pari across that coverage. The bulk of journalists in Pari, members of trustees, down to the reporters, are women. We mandatorily recruit from Dalits and Adivasis if we can get them. Because Dalits and Adivasis are very correctly suspicious of media. They'd rather go into government service where there are some laws to protect them against discrimination 
in private corporate media, their experience has been horrendous. Okay. So, but we still do it because we think it's the only way we also can learn. You know, if they are put down the way they are, we are not free. That's my understanding. So, the erasure also comes as, um, you know, the state inherits and perpetuates many legacies of, com of colonialism. The laws, the judiciary, the whole, it, it perpetuates those institutions and that character. Very importantly, in such, in any such process, the ordinary people, the little people, will get wiped. Their memories, their histories, their relations. You'll find that Adam Hookshine has done something similar with the veterans of civil war in Spain. Only with Americans. Only with Americans who participated. Spain in our hearts, it's called. And uh, he's only looked at the Lincoln brigades that participated. And one of them was also 102 when he interviewed them. The, then the other thing is that the erasure, there is also a, a seizure of uh, historical legacy. Many, many kids do not believe, I mean, when in these upper middle class college students, they don't believe that Dalits participated in these freedoms. They have no idea. If you go and look at, say, the Lal Sena in Vidarbha, it was, I think, 70, 80 percent well. Yeah. And it was a fighting force. Yeah. There were different trends in Dalits as there were different trends in Brahmins. The entire British Empire in India was upheld by a bunch of civil servant bureaucrats who were all Brahmins. There were no Dalits and Christians. There were Christians and Brahmins. Yeah. So that, so that was the thing, yeah. So we have a couple more questions um, in the chat. And uh, one is from Pallavi Das. And uh, it says, did these freedom fighters have their own nationalist consciousness that was independent of the mainstream nationalist movement? We have another one, but I'll maybe okay. pause there. You see, I, I think this is a, it's a complex thing. You know, I do believe there was a central vision of you, even if you look at 1857 uprising, the soldiers who mutinied and rebelled in our court in Tamil Nadu, they got onto their horses and started proceeding towards Delhi huh? in the hope of joining with Bahadur Shah Zafar, the last emperor. So there was some sense of a nation coming into being. It was not a full-fledged thing, but there was an idea. And the other thing, other complexity that will come up when you try looking at this, see that I think that the, the thing is that you can't partition it into compartments probably because it was something in the process of happening. It was a nation in the process of being born. Yeah. There were people who were fighting with very different motivations and motives, etc. So at some point, they become nationalist in the sense you and I understand them. Uh, but the, the entire thing, oh, another thing I will say, the nationalism of the sort that these struggles represented, South Africa, uh, India, they're a very different nationalism from what you're seeing today in and unlike European nationalism, they didn't have anything to apologize for. Okay? Nationalism in the third world produced Gandhi and Mandela. Nationalism in Europe produced Hitler and Mussolini. Now, and that's why I've always had this problem with using nationalism as a blanket term. It has meant different things in different eras, in different periods. Yeah, so it, it's it's very it's a very different and difficult thing to handle. So I will tell you that I find it difficult. Yeah. 
Uh, we have another question from Rijuta Mehta. Says, thank you very much for this talk as well as your work. Could I ask you please to elaborate on the gendered memorialization of the anti-colonial struggle? Your talk mentioned the laws of remembering freedom fighters in India, and I assume these are unspoken social historical norms. But now I'm wondering if you meant something more codified in law. Yeah, you're right. It meant something more codified in law. But it is precisely those unspoken social, social historical norms that get embedded in the law. In 1972, 25 years of freedom, 25 years of independence, rather, we had one law for identifying and uh, recognizing and rewarding freedom fighters at the end of 25 years. In 1980, we updated the law, Swatantrata Sainik Samman Yojana, the, the program to honor freedom fighters. And I think we made some very fundamental mistakes in that, in the law. The first mistake we made was to tie recognition and pension together. In that law, if you're recognized as a freedom fighter, you've got a pension. Now, by the way, the entire left stream rejected the pension. And they were therefore rejecting the recognition also because the two went together in the law. Uh, in, in my book, N. Sankaraya, R. Nallakanne, uh, Madhuswara, they all, they all rejected the uh, pension. And Sankaraya puts it in one line. We fought for freedom, not for pension. Okay? Actually, honestly, looking back, I so wish they had accepted it. I'm looking at the medical, financial, and physical condition of the remaining. The last groups are the Telangana guys who are younger by five years, six years. They're in terrible shape. But that was their idealism. And the, the two communist parties took that as a resolution that we will not accept it because we did not fight to get pensions. However, the linking of pension and recognition meant that you forewent the recognition as well. Now, the recognition had all male roles written in it because it was, the law was written by males. Okay? What kind of things did it do? It asked you to show how many months you went to jail, and it asked you to produce jail certificates. Now, mostly those who went to jail were men. Many women did, but the long-term prisoners, etc., tended to be greater male numbers than women. Then I'll give you one example. Uh, uh, oh, second, the second thing is, so they give seven options to be recognized as a freedom fighter which I call the seven laws of bureaucratic suffering. They ask you to bring certificates to show that you spent at least six months in jail. No bloody under trial in 2024 when he gets out of prison is going to have a certificate. And you're asking someone in the 1980s to produce certificates from the 1920s and 30s. What kind of morons are you? Yeah. Then uh, how many poor people in India have the thing to go, have the wherewithal to go back to that prison in another city and extract their prison certificate and release certificate. They don't. Right? So that was another problem. Third, oh, they gave some concession. Women, Dalit, Tadivas, these three months instead of six months. It's nonsense. Believe it or not, there is a part of the law, coded in the law, underground revolutionaries are explicitly excluded from recognition if, if they went voluntarily underground. You have to have been proclaimed an offender by the British Raj. In other words, we are asking the FN colonizer to certify our, who our freedom fighters were. It's like asking the guards at Auschwitz who were the real victims, to produce the real victims, right? I mean, just imagine, it actually says that. Explicit mention that underground revolutionaries have to 
uh, have been proclaimed offenders. By the way, that wipes out half of Netaji Subhash Bose's INA, including one of the INA members in the book, Lakshmi Panda, a woman who worked in the kitchen and was cooking and feeding the soldier in mobile camps, which moved from place to place as they were bombed by British in Burma. But one example of how a woman's exclusion will tell you, and by incidentally, many women internalized that stereotype that a male is a freedom fighter. The most fascinating character I've met in years is a woman called Babani Mahato, still alive, 105 this year. She, I spent half an morning and afternoon asking her to tell me about her experiences in the freedom struggle, only to be told 200 times, I'm not a freedom fighter. My husband was a freedom fighter. You know, and sarcastically, you should have interviewed him, but you're 20 years late. He died. So I was desperate. I had come a huge distance to her village. And she kept saying, I'm not a freedom fighter. I didn't go to jail. I asked her about Swadesh and so, uh, about uh, uh, Swaraj and Charka and uh, Satyagraha. And she says, Bete, I mean, she's old enough to call me Bete, and says, I was nine when I was married. Where do you think I had time for all your philosophies? <laughs> I, I cooked and I, I, she said I was responsible for feeding a family of 25 to 30 people, a joint family. This is in West Bengal, Purulia, Chepua village. And she says, I was a farmer. I am a farmer. I used to grow the food. I used to come, I used to cook. I would feed a family of 25, 30. My husband went. So later we were to find out that she was thousand times the risk-taking revolutionary that her husband was. But she didn't see it that way because she accepted what society said. Then almost giving up, almost giving up. But just to make some conversation and the hope something clicked. I said, so it must have been very hard for you then when your husband went to jail. She said, no, no. It was much worse when he came back. I said, Babadi, how do you say that? How do you say it was much worse when he came back? She said, oh, you know, he would bring another 20, 25 people to be fed. And under such peculiar circumstances, the penny dropped. And the bulb came. Babani Mahato, at the height of the Bengal famine, 1942, late 42, early 43, the height of the Bengal famine, this woman was feeding, apart from her family of 25, 30, for two months at a time, was feeding underground fugitive revolutionaries harbored by her husband in the Purulia forest. We were dumbstruck. I could speak for five minutes the kind of risk and sacrifice involved. And she knew what she was doing. I, they, they, the revolutionaries produced elaborate schemes to protect the courier and to protect her. She would cook the food. Three rich families. Hers was one of the better off families, landowners. These families were expected to provide food for the 25, 30 fugitives in the forest. How did they know what they were doing? She said, because the women met every morning at the tank. Hmm? And we discussed, what did you do? Because they took turns. But she said, we never knew the individuals we were cooking for. We were asked to do the cooking. Her grandson explained it, who has done a lot of work with her, and keep the food just outside the door. Because not Sometimes they didn't have a door. Outside the house. And leave the house. So that they wouldn't see who is... When they came back, it would be gone. Now that way, that protected the courier 
and it protected Babani so that if they were captured, they didn't know, really didn't know who it was. And those days, as the old people of Purulia, there are three Purulians in the book. They explained to us every village had its spies, the landlord spies, the administrative police spies, the Raj spies of the Raj. Everybody was watching us. And Babani Mahato did this. How, first of all, to grow food during the famine, to feed these guys, that was the risk. I'm glad to tell you she is now rethinking her position. And I will be seeing her with the Bengali edition of the book in April. Every language, we've gone back to the villages and given the families copies of the book. So I hope Rijuta gets some sense of how the, the laws were exclusionary, plus society is exclusionary where it comes to women. But women played an incredible role. Theirs was not, they played much more of a role in the underground, which will not be recognized because of the law. The Lakshmi Sehgal, and who was recognized finally, but yeah. Incredibly important to remember. What's that? Sorry. Uh, so we have one more. Sorry. Yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, we have. Uh, we have. We have. We have time. So we have one online. And go ahead. Okay. Um, but uh, yeah. I mean, I yeah. I'm still. Uh, I'm still talking to uh, what you were talking about. Um, you know, you make the distinction between independence and freedom. Okay. And I was curious to understand what are these understandings of freedom yeah. that you picked up from speaking to them because we're you know we're speaking not only about the regular history but in the example that you just gave i mean freedom is also about the question of human values human relations and i and i'm asking you this question because you know i'm, I'm also thinking about palestine and, and i'm thinking about what's happening in gaza now which i believe it's very, it's not only genocide of people but it's very much an identified of the history of their knowledge of resistance, that's very much what they're trying to eliminate. And, and, and the other, I think there's another Nakba that's happening, which is the failure outside for us to actually recognize what is this conception of freedom that people in Palestine, that's our fighting for. Because that's about conception of the world, about life. And I think it's not very easy to translate these ideas either generationally or, okay. or in space. Um. See, the thing, oh, everyone has va various nuanced positions on what that freedom is, depending on where they're living, what they were encountering. You know, in Telangana, it was one thing. In Rajasthan, it was another. In Rajasthan, much of Rajasthan, Rajmer was the hub. Jaipur badly participated. It was all Raja Rani territory, kings and queens. Now, the thing is, broadly speaking, if I have to give some broad commonalities, every one of them saw independence as an event, freedom as a process. Hmm? They saw independence as an event. Independence meant kicking out the colonizer and forming a na nation state based on citizenship's rights, many of which are in great danger today. But that was what independence meant. Independence meant kicking out the colonizer, nation state based on citizens' rights. Freedom was a much larger project. It was freedom from oppression. Yeah freedom from the shackles, from the social shackles. That's why you find so many of freedom fighters' families were so different in their marriage patterns. They went out of their way. Now, in my family, we have people of all religions and in, in the freedom fighters were trying to build that kind of society. Right? Um, and therefore, there was no trouble in our family when someone married into a different caste or I married a Sikh, I married to a Sikh. All this 
there was in fact a lot of excitement over it. Hmm. So this is one aspect. They tried in their way to bring that uh, you know Sikh, Sipahi Isai, Sikh, Isai Sabko, Sabko Mera Salam that kind, they tried living to that idea. That's, that's one thing. The second thing is there were different notions of like for instance in the coastal areas, you had the salt satyagraha, the Dandi March. Do you know that people in far off landlocked parts of the country responded to the salt satyagraha with forest satyagraha? So they were seeing something in others that spoke to them. Something those others were doing resonated with them. One of the characters in the book, the one character after interviewing whom I broke down and wept was Salihan, the second person in the book. The first two persons in the book are both women, Hausa Bai and Salihan. Salihan was a, her name was Devati Dei Sabar. The Sabars are the most demoralized tribe of Odisha. Do you know why they are demoralized? Nitya, because they are a tribe that had their god stolen from them. The, the god we call, even in the English word we have for that god, Jagannath. Jagannath is the name of taken from Jagannath. Jagannath was not as he is today the captive prisoner of Brahmin Pandas in Odisha. He was the god of the Sabars. He was a deity called Neela Madhava. Neela Madhava was Jagannath. Please go and look at the icons of Jagannath. They are not Brahmanical, they are Adivasi. You go and look at any of the figurines of Jagannath and that whole Rath idea, everything. Though it's one day in the when the Rath is returning, that day if you stand in Koraput, Malkangiri, Narayan Pet, you will see the spectacular picture of Thousands of Adivasis coming down the hills for the Rath. Because he's an Adivasi god. Yeah? In the 11th, 12th century, he is appropriated by the Brahmin, Kshatriya, Raja, Nexus. By the 19th century, the Pandas pass rules banning the suburbs from entering the temple. Now, the, the beauty of it is they do it by putting laws like who all are the categories not allowed. One of them is bird eaters. The suburbs are hunter-gatherers. So automatically they're excluded. This is the people who lost their god. Anyway, they are living in deep forest in Kariyar, uh, that side of Kalandi, the larger Kalandi area. And the Forest Satyagraha, her father Kartik Sabar is one of the organizers of the Congress under it. But Forest Satyagraha, so they're trying to keep with the people in the south and the coastal areas from Gujarat to coastal Odisha. And the Forest Satyagraha meant fighting against its no taxation, not even no taxation without representation. Simply, you don't have a right to tax. Yeah. They were fighting against the Abkhari tax, the tax on entry, timber tax, the tax on entering the town market. Oh, they just said we are not going, we're not going to pay this. So the British did, as always, the most brutal crackdowns on these villages, which were isolated in the forest. You know what the British standard operating procedure of British punishment was? They would raid a village and take all the food grain stocks of the village and burn it in the main square. So that that village would starve for the coming months yeah, and would learn never to muck around with the British. Okay, So they did that in a village called Saliha. In this village called Saliha. They came, they shot Karthik Sabar. He was lying with a bullet in his thigh, bleeding in the, main, in the street of the village. 
Devati Dev, who was then 15 years old, these were unmarried girls working in the forest with their lattes because there are big monkeys and wild cats and all that. A little boy comes and says, your father is lying short on the... She runs there. 15 years old, 16 years old. If she was older than that, she would have been married and sent up. All these 40 girls run there. She sees the British officer standing with his pistol or revolver or whatever and her father lying on the ground. She loses it and beats the hell out of him with the lati. He drops his weapon, starts running. She chases him around the village thrashing. The other 40 girls, looking at what she is doing, they attack the entire British platoon and it's recorded in the Nagpur, in the Central Provinces Gazetteer, in the Nagpur Gazetteer, as the uprising of Saliha, the village name. Then, 40 years later, I mean, sorry, 60 years later, I'm interviewing her. And the memory is fading. But when I talk to her about her father, and divide, she describes it as if it happened that afternoon. Mm -hmm. And talks about how they chased the British out of the village. Now, by the way, there's the gut. What recognition did she get, uh, Palavi? Is the local government gave her a certificate, Saman Patra, that is a letter of honor. What does the letter honor her for? For being the daughter of legendary freedom fighter Kartik Sabar and for bearing three sons. She also had three daughters. See how your socio historical prejudices get codified in certificates of recognition. Hmm. She had three daughters, and this was her achievement. Her sons, and that was her achievement. She was the daughter of Kartik Sabar. That day, four of us guys, the noisiest bunch of journalists who are anyway noisy, after she was dying of hunger. Okay? You could see that she was hungry. And we went back in the car. I think it's a world record, 130 kilometers without any one of us speaking a word, each in his private tears about looking at such graciousness and sacrifice and how it was rewarded. And by the way, now there is a stump, a pillar in the village of Saliha. She's called Salihan because she goes to, gets married, goes to another village. In that village, they call her Salihan, the woman from Saliha. There is a pillar commemorating the uprising in the village, built at a cost of crows or whatever. It has 19 names of people who took part in the uprising. The two names missing are Salihan and her father. And the names on that pillar are mostly upper caste who were simply not present in the village in 1930. It was a deep jungle village. Where the hell will you get pandas and sahus over there? They're there on the pillar. This is your Victor's writing history. Yeah, so that that was her idea of freedom was protecting her forest, her village, her father. So Sankaraya's idea was revolutionary socialism, the Bhagat Singh way. Nalakanis was similar to his. Malu Swarajams was destroying feudalism in Telangana and revolutionary socialism. But if I have to find a common ground for all of them, I would say the finest distillation of their sense of what freedom meant is codified in what we call the Constitution of India. Not just in the preamble, but in the directive principles of state policy. The right to work, the right to food, the right to shelter, the right to dignify life, the right to equal pay, equal work. All these were in their minds and in their heads when they fought. So then freedom was that unreal. And that's why they are fighting late into the 90s and 100s. I meet Shankaraya third time, second time when he's 101. 
100 and he's complaining to me about his family. I said, they just don't let me go, man. They keep saying COVID, COVID. And that guy is speaking who had COVID twice at age 100. The other fellow, equally Nalakan, I tell him, so Nalakan, sir, are you still traveling a lot? He was the guy who organized the communists in the uh, agricultural sector of Tamil Nadu. And he looks at me very disappointed and says, no, comrade, now I'm old. I only travel out of town once a week. <laughs> He's 95 at that point. You know, I, and he said, it's so crestfallen. Now I'm old, comrade. I only travel out once a week. I'm just thinking, where the heck do these guys get it from? Yeah. All of them have that kind of energy. Freedom, that's they, you know, or Nalakarna Shankaraya went, then went on to fight the temple entries, to fight for the release of the uh, peasant from the clutch of the temple lands, which, you know, they were like slaves of the temple. So all those struggles go on. They're active in their 90s. We have time for one more. Do we have time for one more question? Very quickly. Um, the last question is from Diane Reyes. And who are the freedom fighters in contemporary Indian society to continue the struggle? Is a true free society idealistic or realistic? Can it really be achieved? So well, we have yeah, well, well yeah. You, you know, the who are the freedom fighters? To, I will talk about the continuance and spirit in some ways. But I already mentioned for Nandakanda and Shankaraya and Malu Swarajim, independence was it was one junction point. And then they keep fighting. Hmm. Shobaram Geherwar, whose video I showed you, I have I took him to the I took him to a Sophia Girls College, Ajmer. All 17, 18, 19 year old undergrads. Yeah. He spoke for an hour standing and how much he exhorted them to do something radical. Malu Swarajim telling the uh, techies mm -hmm. the slingshot was my weapon, the laptop and the mobile are yours. Do something. So many of these freedom fighters everywhere, they didn't understand that everything is changed. The ruling elite felt that now our state is there, you have justice. Which is pretty far from the truth. But there is also the continuance of the spirit of the freedom struggle. Two things I will tell you. In 2019, when thousands and thousands of teenage students came out onto the streets, stood outside the gates of their college, and read out from the from the preamble of the Constitution in the struggle against the Citizenship Amendment Act. Yeah, and sang, and sang Ham Dekhenge. Yeah, that was a straight line from the struggle for freedom. Even larger, even more powerful than that was the farmers' protest from November 2020 to December 2021. We were talking about we were talking about uh, uh, sorry, what's her name? Or, Dan Reeves. Dan Reeves, yeah. We were talking about, you know, the Occupy Wall Street. Know this, Occupy Wall Street had a few thousand young people, wonderful idealistic people who took over Zikoti Park in Wall Street. And they lasted all of nine weeks. At the end of nine weeks, the mayor of New York gave an order to throw them out, though the owner of Zukoti Park did not call for their eviction. It's a privately owned park. He did not call for their eviction, yet the mayor said, throw them, whatever, out. And the cops did that in 24 hours. The Kisan agitation, the farmers' agitation, held sway at the gates of Delhi 53 weeks and nobody could throw them out. 
they were attacked with water cannon, with barbed wire, with shipping containers. The government dug in violating its own laws, dug trenches in the national highway, 20 feet by 10 feet, and thousands of feet of concertina wire. Two weeks ago, by the way, we became the first nation in the world to use drone warfare against our own farmers. Drones going up and dropping tear gas canisters on them. Not against foreign invaders or deadly terrorists or uh, you know insurgent armies, but against unarmed farmers. Yeah. So with the farmers in Delhi, at Delhi, lost 720 lives to COVID, to hypothermia, through the worst winter of Delhi in 40 years, the worst summer in a decade, horrible torrential rains in the monsoon, 720 people died, but they would not budge. Attacked ferociously, four people died in the middle of winter. You hit an 80-year-old with water cannon, icy cold water. The guy dies after a few days. Okay? Yet, they would not give in. For me, that's the... And it take, let me take you back to the freedom struggle. 1857. Who were those people who stood up and rebelled? You know, we keep saying the re rebellions of Lucknow, Kanpur, Meerut. It was not the citizens of Lucknow, Kanpur, and Meerut who rebelled. It was the soldiers who rebelled. Who were the soldiers? Then and now, the Indian Jawan is a Kisan in uniform. The Indian soldier is a peasant in uniform. I'm not talking about Navy and Air Force, but the armed forces. Incidentally, I'm a very, uh, I have to tell you that I'm a popular speaker at armed forces colleges in India because they get, to, they get the point, right? I'm sitting and talking to a bunch of farmers about the agrarian crisis. And a major general gets up and says, so what you're saying, it's worse than that in my village. <laughs> okay. Yeah. They are peasants in uniform. They are farmers in uniform. They understand. And in 1857, if you were a soldier in the British Army and you got the news that your 48-member joint family had died in a famine, had died in the famine, it took a long time for the news to get around in those days. Yeah. It was not going to endure the red coats to you, right? So then it was farmers, now it's farmers. At the forefront of the battles. Yeah? So I believe the spirit exists. And I could see it kindled in those young kids who started out by saying they gave us trains. And I'm still getting emails from them. As you said, sir, I went and spoke to my grandma. What a travesty that they should have to get their history from there. Well, it's not bad also that you should get your history from your grandma. It's a lot better than getting it from the books we have now. Thank you so much. Um, I guess we don't have any more questions here. So on that note and on that spirit of the freedom struggle, I just wanted to thank you immensely for this incredible talk and this immense uh, uh, sort of depth of, of these stories and inspiration during these times, particularly during these times where we need these stories more uh, than ever and uh, to, to gain strength from um, uh, these uh, many, many freedom fighters who still are there, but their spirit lives within many of us as well. Too many of them are no longer articulate. But as I keep saying, we need their stories in order to better script our own. Thank you. Thank you.